our guest revival is for this week, the Reverend Dr. Lance Watson. Let's receive it with a big amen. Let the church say amen. Amen. And we give all praise and honor and glory to God from whom all blessings flow. And to my friend, my brother, your pastor, your leader, the prophet that God has assigned over your life, Dr. Victor Hall. Would you praise God for him, Dr. may be present in all of the official family of Calvary to these wonderful singers who have led us forth in the singing of praises to our God and to the ushers yeah. who stand as sentinels in this sacred space and to all of you, my brothers and sisters, who thought it not robbery on a Monday night. <laughs> uh, I was just trying to see if you were going to take it. <laughs> on a Tuesday night to come and gather in the house of the Lord and declare God's praise. We greet you in love. We greet you with joy. And we're excited to be here to share this three days with you. So do me a favor. Amen. Do me a favor. Good. Look over at your neighbors. I'm glad you're on my road tonight. Amen. Come on, tell them, say, I'm glad you're on my road tonight. Now, if they didn't talk to you, lean on and say, you owe me $20. Amen. <laughs> I'm just praying. But we are grateful to God to be here tonight. We're grateful to see all of you. And there is a word from the Lord that we'd like to share with you out of the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 4. I want to read in your hearing verses 18 through 24. This is revival. And so each night I want to give you a little instruction and encouragement to help you along that road towards revival. And tonight I want to encourage you to jog your memory. Would you look at your neighbor and say, jog your memory. And the text is Joshua chapter 4, beginning at verse 18. And this is the word of the Lord. And the priests came up out of the river carrying the ark of the covenant of the Lord. No sooner had they set their feet on dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at flood stage as before. On the tenth day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones that they had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their parents, What do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. But the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. And the whole church said, Amen. Amen. Now for a book about conquest, the book of Joshua surely skims on military details. We're not told what weapons Joshua's army used, how many officers did Joshua's army have, how many men made up each of his battalions. Did Joshua have an elite Delta fighting force like the Navy SEALs? And if so, what training did he require in order to be admitted? The answer to those questions and so many more we do not know. And we do not know because the emphasis in this sacred narrative is not on the physical battle, it's on the spiritual one. The real conflict of the Israelites wasn't with the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, or the Amorites, but it was with Satan and his demons. Canaan was the choicest real estate on earth. It connected Africa with Europe. It accessed 
the Mediterranean Sea. It was marked by fertile fields and lush valleys. But most importantly, if you follow the narrative of Scripture, the land was God's gift to the people of Israel. Nearly seven centuries earlier, God had told Abraham in Genesis 12, 7, to you and your descendants, I will give this land. God set this property apart for his people and then set his people apart to be a blessing to the world. God promised Abraham, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great and you will be a blessing. Yeah. This amalgamated assortment of bad lands Bedouins would become the couriers of God's covenant to a galaxy of people around the globe. Israel yeah. would be the parchment upon which God's redemption story would ultimately be written. The city of Jerusalem, the town of Bethlehem, the sacrifices of the temple, the prophecies of the prophets yeah. would all unfold on this land. The redeemer yeah. of the world would be born here, walk here, live his life here. He would soak this dirt with his blood and shake this ground with his resurrection. Yeah. So the book of Joshua isn't ultimately about claiming real estate for a dislocated nation, but it's ultimately about preserving a stage for the unfolding of God's redemptive plan. Yeah. And Satan's counter strategy was clear, contaminate the promised land and preempt the promised child. Destroy God's people and disrupt God's work. So Joshua's battle then was a spiritual one. And can I suggest to you right off the top tonight, so is ours. Yeah. Tap your neighbor and say, I know that's right. <laughs> Our fight is not ultimately against people on earth, but against rulers and authorities and powers of this world's darkness, against the spiritual powers of evil in the heavenly realm. And that's why every day God blesses you to open your eyes, you ought to put on the whole armor of God. Yeah. Ephesians 6.12 says, Then on the day of evil you will be able to stand strong, and having done all to stand, stand. Now I recognize, I really do, that in our current contemporary cultural climate, that the idea of evil, abstract, or incarnate strikes most people as old, antiquated, out of date, uh, outdated, and odd. The popular trend in our time is to blame all of our issues and our problems on genetics, the government, our mononym, and the environment. Yeah. Yet the Bible presents a very real and present foe to our faith and our future. And the scriptures go further to personify and name that presence as Satan. Sometimes he's called the devil or the adversary. Other times, Beelzebub, Belial, the tempter, the evil one, yeah. the accuser, the brother, and the prince of demons, the ruler of this world, or the prince of the power of the air. But whatever name you choose, he is the enemy and he is real. He is not the cute and harmless character of our cartoons. He is not the imaginary dark counterpart to the Easter bunny. He is the bunny. He is the invisible yet forceful fallen angel that Isaiah named as Lucifer who desired the high place that only God could occupy. He rebelled, he disobeyed, and he fell, and he wants you and I to do the same thing. But the devil is a liar. And whenever you begin to have an affinity for lies, you know that the enemy has your ear. That's been my challenge, quite honestly, friends, with the current administration occupying 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Because for whatever reason, they have a disruptive and discrepant relationship with the truth. Can I have a moment? Because if you have watched the news recently or any time in the last year, it should be clear to you by now that we are not now a nation that seeks liberty and justice for all. It is clear that we no longer hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal. You don't have to think like I think. You
you don't even have to agree with me, but we are in a crisis of morality, and that's not an alternative fact, and nor is it fake news. <laughs> Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, vanity asks, is it popular? Politics asks, will it work? But conscience and morality must always ask, is it right? <laughs> Is it right for millions of children to go to bed hungry every night in the United States while the Congress passes a farm bill to cut the supplemental assistance program that gives food to the hungry? Is it right that the elderly and the sick among us die because health care is inaccessible and medication is unaffordable as companies put profit in front of people? Is it right to monetize incarceration such that there's no rehabilitation in the situation, only the frustration of lifelong limitation for those trapped in the unjust, unjust criminal justice system? Is it right for us to encourage little white children to set up lemonade stands and applaud them for being enterprising and entrepreneurial, but when a little black girl sells water in front of her own house, we call 911 like she's a threat to the public safety? Is it right for the sitting president of the United States to behave like he behaves? Preach, Lance Watson. Is it right for a police officer to shoot an unarmed black teenager running away in the back and yet right men with subatomic machine guns can shoot and kill boatloads of people and still somehow be peaceably and nonviolently taken into custody and get due process? Is it right to institute a zero tolerance immigration policy that forcibly detaches children from their parents and puts them in cages with little mylar blankets and no substantive plan that ever reunite them with their parents? Is it right for you to be caught on video, Mr. President, degrading Hispanic Americans about their accent and chiding that they need to learn how to speak English when the first lady up in the White House can't even put a whole sentence together right. I'm just trying to ask, is it right? I know y'all didn't come to revival for this. I, I know you came because you wanted me to say he may not come when you want him. But we all am okay with that, amen. But I just want to know first, is he right? See, the enemy is real. He's a liar. And any person who has ever dared to draw near to God has felt already the enemy's attack. He has three primary objectives according to Jesus of Nazareth in John 10. And then he shows up to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And I've got news for you tonight, those of you who came to revival through the weather on Tuesday night, the enemy is ticked off at you. All this talk about the rest of your days being the best of your days, about no weapon formed against you, being able to prosper, about all things working together for your good, about it's time for you to be there to be a revival and it's going to start with me has put the enemy in a foul mood. Your days struggling did not trouble him. Your nights lost, confused, angry, disappointed, and without purpose did not bother him. But now you have the nerve, you have the unmitigated gall to think about, talk about, and step towards God's future for your life and for your church. You dare to walk in faith and not in fear, to lean on grace and not live in guilt, to hear God's voice more and listen to the enemy's voice less. I need to tell you tonight the enemy has you squarely in his gun sights. You are on his hit list. But before you get scared, don't trip because you might be on his hit list, but you're still on Jesus' mailing list. And as long as you're on his mailing list, everything is going to be all right. We go and tap your scared neighbor, say, you ain't got to be afraid. Amen. See, 
for the first time, for the first time in nearly five centuries, Hebrews and the text were camping in Canaan. This was the moment they had been waiting for. This was the hour they had dreamt about. How many times had they gazed across the Jordan at that lush land? Some of them were old timers like Joshua and Caleb. They had been waiting for 40 years and somebody in Calvary tonight knows what it is to hold on to a single promise from God for a long time. When God opened the waters of Jordan, they didn't have to wait to be asked twice. Joshua 4.13 reports that all told about 40,000 armed soldiers crossed over before God to the plains of Jericho. They're ready for battle. They're ready to rock and roll. They're ready to get it on. They hurried across, sounding like Drake. It's a lot of bad things they be wishing and wishing and wishing. Oh, y'all know the song. But, but it's God's plan. See, had God not stopped them, they would have run straight on in to Jericho. But God did stop them because what they didn't understand is they weren't quite ready. Have you ever been eager for what you wasn't ready for? Tap in there to say, leave me alone, all right? It's a different. God wanted to give them one more word before they went in. And I'm thinking now of my sainted mother who's gone on to glory, five foot one, 120 pounds soaking wet, who brought 17 children into this world. And when she sent us to school on the first day of school every year, she always sent us the same way, with lunchbox full, breakfast now eaten, jackets and school supplies. I'm talking about Crayola, the eight pack, and the six Y'all know nothing about that. Crayola, the eight pack or the 64 pack with the sharpener in the We don't know, amen. See, she sent us the same way. She'd get up all of us out of the door. We would all have to stand on the front porch. And one by one, she would stop us. And after a while, we knew what was coming. She would get on out of level with each one of her kids and say the same thing. She says, you leave today. I want you to remember what I taught you. I want you to remember who you are. I want you to remember whose you are. You are Watson, and you bet not embarrass this family. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm preaching to the time out crowd. We didn't, we didn't have time out in my house. It was lights out. If you didn't behave, your lights got turned out. They raised us with a Bible and a belt. If they couldn't preach Jesus in you, they beat the devil out of you. Amen. And, and that's exactly what God did right here. God brought their impending invasion to a halt. And by virtue of a few commands, he prepared them for what he had for them. I'm already in verse 1 where it says, And it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan. God gave them these instructions. Y'all go back and get 12 stones so that in the future when your children inquire about your journey, you can jog your memory and tell them what happened. Joshua assembled and commanded a dozen men from each tribe to return to the riverbed, to the very area where the priests had stood. The men dislodged those 12 stones and as the people watched and the waters resumed their flow, Joshua stacked the stones one on top of another and when the 12th rock was securely placed on the top spot he turned and said in the future when your children ask what do these stones mean I want you to tell them as Miles Jones would say that God brought you through wet places on dry ground can I hang out right there for a moment because I want to share with you at the beginning of the revival what is the secret to surviving in hostile territory. Here it is. I won't keep you waiting because I want you to come back Wednesday and Thursday. If you're going to survive and thrive in the midst of hostile environments, number one, you've got to remember what God has already done. Would you look at your neighbor and say, remember neighbor. That means you've got to record God's accomplishment somewhere in your memoirs. You've got to capture every crossing somewhere in your memory before you look forward to whatever your Jericho is, you should first look backward to whatever your Jordan has been and remember what God accomplished.
us there. At least you ought to be as consistent as Facebook. Now I recognize that many of you are not social media savvy, but Facebook has this feature now that they use on everybody's home page where they put on display and they'll go back into your postings two years, four years, six years, eight years, and they'll pull up pictures you took back in the day. Postings you made back in the day. Things you said back in the day. And they will remind you of what you were posting, saying, thinking, and doing back in the day. And that's the minimum that every one of us should do in our relationship with Almighty God. That somewhere in your archives, you ought to have some snapshots, some posts, some text messages, some reminders of what God has already done in your life and periodically and revival is a good time you ought to go back and pull them up some years ago my daughter reminded me of this truth I was driving her to one of her classes and she noticed that I wasn't talking like I normally do can you imagine that Lance Watson not talking amen me not talking as fast as I talk and as much as I talk can you imagine driving in the car and I'm not talking. Uh, she said, what's wrong with you, Dad? I said, well, I'm worried about a few deadlines I've got to meet. She said, have you ever had deadlines before? I said, yes. She said, how many? I said, I hundreds, maybe thousands of them. She said, well, have you ever missed any of the deadlines before? I said, not for the most part. She said, so let me get this clear. In the past, God has helped you to meet hundreds, maybe thousands of deadlines. She said, Dad, don't you think that given what he's already done, that he can help you with whatever deadline you are now facing? Translation, you need to stack some rocks down. See, Satan has no recourse to your testimony. Your best weapon against the enemy's attack is a good memory. I want to encourage you tonight. Don't forget a single blessing. Remember, God forgives your sins. Everyone, God heals your disease by his grace. God redeems your life over and over. God crowns you with love and mercy and joy unspeakable. God wraps you in goodness all the days of your life. The angel of the Lord is going before you and goodness and mercy are coming behind you. God renews your eagle, your youth, so that it appears like an eagle. God restores your joy every time you ask. God sustains your peace even in the midst of the storm. God will make everything work out right. Come out right. In the right. Won't he do it? Psalm 103, verse 6, one of my favorite psalms. You ought to memorize this text. It says, he puts victims back up on their feet. You ought to create a trophy room in your heart. And every time you experience a victory, put a memory up on your shelf. Before you face whatever your next contest, your next challenge, your next crisis, your next circumstance is, take a quick tour of God's accomplishments. Look at all the paychecks he's provided, all the blessings he has given, all the prayers he has answered. Think of all the sickness he has healed, and all the burdens he has lifted, all the ways he has made, all the doors he has opened, all the battles he has fought, all the bills he has paid, all the wrongs he has righted, all the problems he solved, all the victories he has given and give God the glory, the honor, and the praise that is due his name. See, so don't go to Jericho until you remember Jordan. That was Joshua's first instruction. They said, all right, we got to check it off the checklist. Can we attack now? Go on, tap the neighbor, say, slow your roll, neighbor. Because that's what Joshua said. He said, the stones are stacked. The moment is memorialized. But God has another instruction before we go into battle. you got to not only remember what God has already done, but you got to remember whose you are. I'm in mean, verse 2. It says, at that time, God said to Joshua, make flint knives for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again 
the second time. Now, now I, I won't even talk about what that means. Circumcise them again the second time. It's painful for me to even articulate that. Circumcise again. All the men should be shouting right here. Amen. The second time. Because 600 years earlier, God had inaugurated this practice of male circumcision. Circumcision, God told Abraham, will be the sign, the physical sign of the covenant between me and you. That's Genesis 17, 1. Eight days after the birth of every male child, they would be symbolically set apart by having their private parts all and this act symbolized that they were children of the covenant, that they belonged to the commonwealth of Israel, that they were inheritors of the promise. And during the wilderness wanderings, they let this practice lapse, and it's not hard to see why, because the act would leave the men convalescing for weeks, their wives, their children, their property totally unprotected. Enemy nations were watching their every move. It didn't seem logical. Shouldn't they have allowed the men to remain at maximum strength so that they could fight off any would-be predators. Yet notice in the text that God was not concerned with their strength. He was not concerned with their numbers. He was not concerned with their skills. He was concerned that they remember whose they were. Specifically, that God, according to Joshua 5, 9, had, quote, rolled away the reproach of Egypt. That phrase, the reproach of Egypt, was a reference to their oppression, suppression, repression, and depression that they had endured while being enslaved in Egypt for 430 years. It was time for them to step up and step forward and reclaim their birthright as God's chosen people. And can I suggest to you on a Tuesday night, it's time for us to reclaim ours. Circumcision was about identification, but also it was a symbolic, don't miss this, separation from the past. Boom, that went over your head, like Freddie Haynes would say. See, this act declared their new identity. Listen, you are no longer who you were. You are mine. No longer slaves. You free. No longer incarcerated. Not been liberated. God's message to the Hebrews and to us. Remember whose you are. Because in a real sense, all believers, male and female, have been circumcised. I know that might be news to you tonight, but that's why you shouldn't be a two-verse Bible scholar. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, Paul said, when you came to Christ, he set you free, not by a bodily operation of circumcision, but by a spiritual operation of circumcision, the baptism of your soul. Christ cut away your old life. He severed you from the power and the penalty of sin and death. Your old issues, your old phobias, your old dysfunctions, your old anxieties, your old fears, your old apprehension have all been severed. He detached you from their power when you gave your heart to Christ. It cannot be stated too clearly or too often. You are not the person that you used to be and you are only a fraction of the person that you can be when you let go and let God. Your former self no longer exists. Your old life is disempowered. When Christ died, you died. When Christ was buried, you were buried. When Christ rose, you rose. You are a brand new you. And on this first night of revival, this is a good time to claim it. You ought to just tap your neighbor and say, it's a new me sitting over here. See, I, because even if things are over your head, they are still up under his feet. You know why? God never wastes a wound. Boy, that's tweetable right there. I'm preaching a lot better than y'all shouting. But I'm having a good time. Look, see, in fact, God finds value in what we are willing to throw away. Let, let me explain. One of my sons in the ministry, Dr. Larry Ennis, was talking to me about his favorite store. We were having some chit-chat after service one day, and he said, Pastor, you know my favorite store is Walmart. I said, Walmart? He said, 
there at Walmart, and he went on to share with me that when he was in college, he didn't have a lot of money trying to matriculate through college. So he learned to use, listen, his Walmart bags as freezer bags. I said, what? You use the Walmart bag as a freezer bag? He said, yeah. Well, I pay money for a glad freezer bag when you get these Walmart bags for free. He said, every week I go to Walmart, buy a family pack of chicken wings. He said, I get it home, break it down in about four wings per bag. I freeze them, and when I got ready to cook them, they turn out just right to y'all. Some of y'all trying not to feel me right here, but if I went to your house tonight, you got Walmart bags hanging on your doorknob, a, a drawer full of Walmart bags so full you can't even close them. You're using it as a trash bag. Larry pointed out to me, he said, we keep those bags because we know that after we buy our groceries and get them home and put them away, that those bags still have value. Now call me because just as we find value in a Walmart bag, I came to tell you that God finds value in you and me. God finds value in your problems, your pains, your pressures, your predicaments. God can get something out of everything. God can use anything to accomplish everything. God can use what hurts you to heal you. God can use what sets you back to set you up. God can use your rejection to give you a new direction if you just remember who you are. Okay, let me come at it like this. Pastor did mention, he mentioned I have three children, but he didn't mention I have five grandchildren. And I love my grandchildren. You know what my prayer for you is tonight? My prayer for you is that you live long enough and strong enough for God to give you some grandchildren. Amen. Kids are great, but grandchildren are better. Amen. They are better. I figured this thing out. You know what? Grandchildren are the gift that God gives you for not killing your kids. Amen. I, I figured that thing out. See, I, I've got five grandchildren, and my granddaughter, Rachel, she loves to draw. And recently, we were working together in one of her workbooks, and she was drawing. But I looked down, and you know this Papa looking down, and all of her lines were crooked. So you can't just break it on it. You know, you'll break their spirit. You just dropping on your I got crooked like no. You gotta say it gently. You gotta figure out how to put it across. So I said, I said, baby, you know Papa I love you. Yeah, Papa. I said, baby, what you doing is good. Okay, Papa. I said, but baby, your lines are a little crooked. And she put the crayon down, looked me right now, and I said, Papa, I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> I said, all right, baby, but let me introduce you to something. I said, do you know what this is? And she said, no. Nah. She said, what is that? And I said, this is called a ruler. And I said, do you know what to do with it? She said, no. Nah. I said, well, do you see how your lines are crooked? That's because you are trying to do them all by yourself. You need a ruler because the ruler will help you keep your stuff straight. Come here real quick. I want to encourage you, my friend, not to live another crooked year of your life trying to do it all by yourself. You need a ruler, and I've got a suggestion for you tonight. His name is Jesus Christ. Is there anybody in Calvary who can testify tonight that he'll help you keep your stuff straight? for you to exchange your sorrow for a swagger, to trade in your inability for your inheritance because you don't just have a passport, you have a ticket. A passport tells you where you're from, but a ticket says where you're going. You are a new creation. Greater is he that lives in you than he that lives in the world. You've got something so awesome on the inside of you that every time the enemy looks at you, it scares the hell out of you got power on the inside that empowers you to handle anything that's thrown at you from the outside. I don't, I don't know if you've seen them or if you watch them, but I, I don't know if you've ever
ever seen a military Hummer? I know you've seen Hummers humming around New York. I ain't talking about that. But a military Hummer, it's slightly different than a regular Hummer. But pay attention the next time if you happen to see one on the street. I did. And I noticed, Pastor, that there was a gadget attached to each one of their tires. At the stoplight, I'm gazing at this gadget on the tire, and it had the letter CTI written on it, and not knowing what CTI was, I said with my sixth degree holding self, that's what Google is for. <laughs> Again, y'all slow, amen. So I looked it up on Google, and I discovered that CTI stands for Central Tire Inflation. Now, I didn't know what that was, so I went a little further in Google, and it means that those Hummers, watch this, are equipped in such a way that they can change the air pressure in the tire without ever stopping or leaving the vehicle. You can't drive on dirt like you drive on asphalt, so they equip those Hummers with CTI so that, watch this, even though conditions change on the outside, you don't have to stop the journey, you don't have to abandon the vehicle in order to make a change because you've got a button on the inside that will make a change on the outside and allow you to keep going where you're trying to go. All my Bible students are already there because that's how the Holy Ghost functions in the life of a believer when conditions change on the outside. We ain't got to stop the journey. We ain't got to abandon the church because we've got something on the inside that will allow us to adjust to whatever is happening on the outside. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? See, we've got Holy Ghost Get up survival in enemy territory. You how do you jog your memory? You gotta remember what God has done. You gotta remember who you are. Can I give you one more? Okay. You gotta remember where you are. And where were they in the text? It's gonna be so quick. I guarantee you're gonna miss it. It's gonna go right over here. I'm telling you in advance. Where were they in the text? They were almost there. I told you don't miss it. Amen. That's don't fall apart when you almost there. Don't give up when you almost there. Don't quit when you're almost there. You'll be tempted to throw in the towel. The fight will be hardest. The night will be darkest. The enemies will be fierce. But don't give up when you're almost there. That's why everybody around you may seem like they're getting their blessing before you. But know that if God is blessing your neighbors, that means God is in the neighborhood and it's only a matter of time before God gets to your house. Can I get you to touch your neighbor and say, you almost there. See, the Hebrews did what God commanded and God did what he promised. You got to remember what God has done. Remember who you are. But then remember where you are. That you are almost there. That's what Jesus did because the enemy tried to make him quit in the garden of Gethsemane. His prayers were so intense that Luke implied that his sweat was like drops of blood. He wanted to find another way to get his mission done because I heard him say, Lord, if it is possible, let the cup pass from me. This is too hard. This is too much. This is too formidable. This is too severe. This is too agonizing. This is too painful. Let the cup pass. But then he lifted up his hand and lifted up his head and in the shadow of Calvary said, nevertheless, my friend, if you're going to survive, you got to have a nevertheless in your vocabulary. Not my real, but yours be done. Because I'm almost there, just a little further, and Judas will betray me. Just a little further, and Peter will deny me. Just a little further, and Pilate will dismiss me. Just a little further, and Herod will condemn me. Just a little further, and the soldiers will beat me. While the crowd mocks me, just a little further, and my disciples will abandon me. My family will forsake me just a little further, and they'll stretch me high and stretch me wide. But if I be lifted up, if I be lifted up, he remembered where he was. I'm almost there at the intersection of grace and mercy. I'm almost there at the corner of truth and love. I'm almost there at the intersection of 
humanity's sin and heaven's salvation. And I believe Jesus said, I can't give up now. And thanks be to God, he didn't give up. I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm glad he didn't give up. I'm glad he went all the way. Because he did, my soul is saved. My past is part. My future is fixed. My hope is bright. My joy is full. I'm glad he did because he went all the way. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's bank. I'm glad he didn't give up. And because he didn't, God raised him up with all power in his hands and gave him a name that's above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee must bow and every tongue confess would you shake somebody's hand in encouragement tonight and look them in the eye and say neighbor you're almost there one more prayer one more praise one more shout 